I have uh, been fascinated for some decades with uh, hurricanes, and I wanted to talk to you about uh, the, some very interesting aspects of hurricanes and how they're going to respond to climate change. This is something I've been working on for about 30 years. Um, I want to preface my remarks to saying that when it comes to climate change, uh, some of the effects that we feel as human beings are felt through the extreme events that accompany them. So if I say to you, or if a climate scientist says to you, gee, the world's going to warm up three degrees, why would you care about that? I mean, you can get three degrees by moving from, uh, from here to, um, say, uh, Nashville, okay? Um, it's not a big deal. And you know what doesn't actually mean anything to me as a human being, three degrees. What means something to me is failures of crops, failures of water supply from drought, uh, floods from excessive rain. It's the extreme events we care about. And I'm going to focus some of my talk today on hurricanes as an example of an extreme event that has strong effects on society. So the program is I'm going to start out with a just a quick overview of hurricanes so we know what we're talking about, a quick overview of climate change from a climate scientist standpoint, and then go on to the subject of how climate change might affect hurricanes, which we're learning more and more about. And then uh, probably the most important aspect of the talk that can be generalized to other areas is how do we go about quantifying hurricane risk in a changing climate? And at the end of the talk, I'm going to argue that the only way we're ever going to really be able to deal rationally with this as a society is to make the risk personal as opposed to global. That is, each and every one of us, everyone we know around the world. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. This is a, a satellite view. I'm sure you've all seen pictures like this of a hurricane in space, uh, from space. And uh, you're looking down, I think you can see in the upper left, the, uh, the, the peninsula of Florida. This is a hurricane that was headed toward Florida, but went up into the Carolinas, called Floyd. It's been doctored by the engineers at NASA to give it a kind of three-dimensional perspective. You see this swirling mass of clouds, uh, a few hundred miles in diameter, typically, with the deepest clouds, uh, the very heaviest rain, and the strongest winds uh, concentrated in an annulus, like a donut, often around a cloud-free eye, which you can see in the, in the left-hand side of that picture. Um, the wind circulation in the northern hemisphere is counterclockwise. We call that cyclonic, except right at the top of the storm, which is what you're seeing when you look at the satellite picture, where it's actually going the other way. So the spin of a hurricane reverses as you go up. When you look at the top of the storm, you're looking at mostly ice clouds. This is one of the interesting little factoids about the atmosphere, is the coldest air you can find anywhere in the atmosphere, even including Antarctica, is in the tropics but not at the surface, maybe 13 or 14 miles above the surface. So the temperature at the top of the hurricane is around minus 70 or minus 80 degrees C, which is well below minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Colder than Chicago in the winter, let's believe it that way. <laughs> now, we've been flying aircraft into hurricanes uh, since the mid-1940s. I've done it quite a few times, and I personally think everybody should see the eye of a hurricane. It's spectacular. It's really beautiful, and it can't be captured in a picture. This happens to be the eye of Hurricane Katrina from 2005. And uh, when you fly into it, it's like being in an enormous Roman Colosseum, except that it, instead of being a few hundred yards across, it's um, more like 40 miles across, and it's 12 miles high, and you see the bright blue sky of the stratosphere above you. You often have a kind of a waterfall of ice crystals going down the inside of this uh, inner edge of the eye, which we call the eye wall, for obvious reasons. Um, I think I might someday start a hurricane safari to take people in to see the eyes of the hurricane. By the way, um, you might think it's very turbulent to fly in a hurricane. It's not, really. You've all, most of you, I expect, have been on jets, and you sometimes are told you're going to be either very late or very early because of winds, and those winds can easily be 150 miles an hour, but you don't notice. Um, you're happily sipping your coffee or your bourbon, depending on your inclinations, and um, uh, you don't notice it because what affects an airplane is, is variations of wind on the scale of the airplane. 
and this is an enormous circulation. So I can tell you for a fact that I have been on much more turbulent rides on United Airlines than I ever was in a hurricane. Okay, just a little physics for the uh, physicists and thermodynamicists in the audience. Um, we're going to look at the energy cycle of a hurricane. Now, one of the great misnomers that you can read about in any undergraduate textbook on meteorology is that hurricanes are driven by heat released in the condensation of clouds. That isn't true. There is a lot of heat release, but it isn't what drives the storm. The storm is driven by the flux of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. And in fact, in computers, we can make that work in a dry world without any water at all. Um, it's that heat flux that drives storms, and it's why hurricanes die when they move over land. It's not because there's more friction, although there is, um, and it's not because there's a lack of a supply of water, it's a lack of supply of heat from the ocean. So this is a kind of a pie slice through a hurricane. This is a, kind of a cartoon showing uh, the eye uh, and, and the, uh, actually the yellow denotes the vertical motion in the storms. So this is going about, um, oh, I forgot to say, it's about 200 kilometers out from the center and it's maybe 18 kilometers high. And we're gonna take a little cutaway like that and look at a cross section through this. So this goes from um, the center of the storm on the left all the way out to 200 kilometers on the right and up to 18 kilometers. So it's a vertical cross section. I've got a cartoon eye wall cloud in there. And if you were so unwise as to get in a hot air balloon at point A at the bottom there and go for a ride down close to the ocean surface, you would spiral in. Uh, you're going around the storm, of course, but you're also drifting in. And when you get to B, you'd shoot up the eye wall and, um, and, and be spat out the top of the storm at about 16 or 18 kilometers altitude. Um, and then uh, if you actually were to follow the air along over a period of many weeks, it would subside from C to D and then back down to A. Now in nature that doesn't happen because the air gets mixed up with other systems, but in a computer model you can put a wall out there and uh, that's what happens. Now the lurid colors you see on this diagram are a measure of the heat content of the air. For the physicists, it's, it's the entropy of a mixture of dry air, water vapor, and condensed water. It's a conserved variable. The only way to change it is to have a flux from the ocean or an infrared radiative flux to space. And you'll notice that it goes, if we consider this to be a steady uh, hurricane, and they can be steady for a while. When you go from A to B, you're going from cold colors to warm colors. The entropy is increasing, and that reflects the flux of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. That's what's making the entropy go up. And then when it shoots up the eye wall and goes out, it conserves its entropy. We call that an adiabatic process. And then over a much longer period of time, the entropy it got from the ocean surface is lost by infrared radiation to space. Now, the remarkable thing about this is if any of you have ever taken a course in thermodynamics, and I know some of you have had from talking to you, so you can't hide, um, this turns out to be remarkably the four legs of a perfect Carnot heat engine. So the Carnot heat engine, uh, Sadie Carnot was a fascinating person who lived in a French scientist lived in the 19th century and sort of founded in some ways the field of thermodynamics and he discovered that a heat engine is an engine that converts heat energy into mechanical energy or some other form of energy and the most efficient one you can have has a particular cycle that the hurricane obeys and that's as it moves from A to B it gains heat but its temperature stays constant thanks to the contact with the ocean surface. And then it, uh, the second leg is an adiabatic expansion. The air moves to lower pressure, uh, but conserves its entropy. Then you have an isothermal uh, from C to C, C to D, an isothermal compression, and finally an adiabatic compression from D to A. Voila, the Carnot engine. And that is perhaps why the most placid uh, places in the, in the whole global atmosphere, the tropics, are also responsible for breeding the most violent storms on the planet. It's because when this thing does get going, it's operating at, at incredible efficiency. It's a very interesting story. The, the end of that story is that we can use our understanding of the physics to place an upper bound on how strong the winds can be as a function of how warm the ocean is and basically how 
cold the atmosphere is. I meant to go through this cycle, but we've done that. And here is the annual maximum uh, wind speed, uh, this is in meters per second, that you can have in a hurricane at any point on the Earth in the current climate. All right, this is just based on climate data, not hurricane data. And it puts a rigid upper bound on how strong the winds can be. Now, if you put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere or do other, something else to change the climate, this will change as well. Uh, so that, you can consider that to be the speed limit for hurricanes. Now, just to uh, uh, keep going on a kind of overview on hurricanes, this is just a map showing the tracks of tropical cyclones from the middle of the 19th century to 2010, with the red colors indicating uh, stronger winds. And so you can see the main hurricane belts around the planet. We're all familiar with the North Atlantic storms. There's one trying to form in the Gulf of Mexico right now, by the way. Um, and, uh, but we don't hear about very much about the hurricanes in the rest of the world. Only about 10% of the world's hurricanes occur in the Atlantic, but they get 99% of the press. So you have a belt in the Eastern Pacific, Western North Pacific, Arabian uh, Sea, Bay of Bengal, and then a belt in the Southern Hemisphere. No storms on the equator, uh, because the equator is a place where if you look straight up, the, uh, the uh, Earth's rotation doesn't project onto that. And so you can't have a long-lived rotating storm uh, on the equator. So if you are a sailor, as I am, and you want to go around the world and you're terrified of hurricanes, just stick to the equator and you'll be fine. You may have other problems, but you won't have that problem. Now, going to the social side of things, it's, they are very serious hazards. So these are statistics you can get from an online database that I show at the bottom. Um, about 15,000 deaths per year since 1971, uh, more than a trillion do dollars in damages since that time. And the really scary thing is that the global population exposed to hurricanes has tripled since 1970. Now, of course, the global population hasn't gone up that fast. This is a reflection of all over the world, for all kinds of reasons, people are moving from inland areas to coastlines. And this has people who are very worried about managing this hazard uh, upset, OK? What do we do about this? And as I'm about to show you, this happens at a time when the hurricanes themselves are arguably becoming more dangerous. And the confluence of those two uh, produces this trend in damage. So what you see on this chart from 1900 to 2020, uh, from the same database, by the way, is the global damage due to hurricanes divided by the world uh, domestic product. Okay, so it's a normalized, the fraction of the world domestic product lost to hurricanes. And you can see there's a big upward trend. Now, most of this upward trend, maybe all of it, it's hard to tell, is because of this uh, demographic trend of people moving toward coastlines. So 380% increase since 1970, but the population in these uh, hurricane-prone places has increased by about 200%. So there might be a bit of a climate change aspect to that as well. It's very hard to, to tease that out. Something you may not know, which is illustrated by this chart, that's a little bit of a morbid chart, quite literally. It just shows what actually causes deaths in hurricanes. Almost all of it is water. And this is something most people don't realize. They think, think of hurricanes as windstorms, which they are. They're very violent windstorms. But people die from floods caused by torrential rains and uh, storm surges uh, that are caused indirectly by wind blowing over uh, ocean waters. The wind is sort of down there as a relatively minor factor. So when we worry about the hazard, we're worried mostly about water. Uh, now let me just uh, change gears completely for a moment, and then I'm going to try to marry the two threads of the talk and talk about um, climate. And so this is like a Climate 101 introduction. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about greenhouse gas-induced climate change. There are a lot of other things that can cause the climate to change. The greenhouse effect was discovered by this dour-looking Irish physicist, John Tyndall, a very gifted polymath. Uh, who built the apparatus you see there, which still exists, and it's on display in the British Museum in London. 
It's a long tube, and what he could do is fill that tube with gases of his choosing. And then he would shine uh, light of various wavelengths through that tube and measure how much of that light was, uh, was absorbed by the gas in the tube. He'd measure how much came out the other end, if you will, and deduced how much was absorbed. Uh, very, very painstaking measurements. Now, he did what all of us would do who've had, uh, who've had high school chemistry. You start with the most abundant gases in the atmosphere, nitrogen, oxygen, molecular nitrogen and oxygen, nothing. No absorption. Thought something was wrong with the apparatus. Uh, then he said, well, let's try some other gases. And he put water vapor in, which is the next most abundant gas, and found there was a lot of absorption in the infrared, mostly, by water vapor. And then tried some other gases, including carbon dioxide. So to summarize what he found, well, let me just begin with this first. This is just the composition of the atmosphere. Um, as you perhaps know already, most of it's nitrogen and oxygen, a little bit of argon. And that orange slice, and I strongly suspect if you're in the back room you can't even see it, is water vapor uh, and carbon dioxide, which happen to be the only, or the two most important gases that absorb radiation, infrared radiation in the atmosphere. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. And it was a shock to the physics community of that time that our atmospheric temperature is strongly controlled by this tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. Okay. Well, there may be, for all I know, a thermostat in the back of this room. And if it's an old one, it has a bead of mercury, which slides in a tube and controls the temperature in the room. We have all kinds of instances where tiny amounts of a substance can have huge effects. All right. And if you, if you were so, uh, so uh, unfortunate as to eat a little bit of this mercury, it could kill you, all right, even though it's not very many molecules compared to your body. So it's not a singular example, but it's nevertheless a surprising one. And that orange slice makes the difference. And there's, by, by the way, no controversy about this in physics and climate science between having uh, the mean observed mean surface temperature of around 60 degrees Fahrenheit globally and something closer to zero degrees Fahrenheit, and we wouldn't be here to talk about it. So that little tiny slice, uh, it, it, it bothers people, and it bothered physicists of that time. And what is the greenhouse effect? It has not much to do with greenhouses, but we have to, we're stuck with that term. Um, Let's consider first a sort of a simple atmosphere where there are no greenhouse gases, uh, which is almost the atmosphere we have. So sunlight comes in, and I'm skipping a lot of things like clouds. It's absorbed by the surface, and the surface would just get hotter and hotter were it not also emitting radiation, and it emits infrared radiation. And uh, it emits it in proportion to how hot the surface is. So the surface has to get hot enough to emit enough radiation to balance the sunlight. And that gives you a temperature of about uh, minus 18 degrees C. That's how warm the surface would be uh, without greenhouse gases. But there are greenhouse gases. And what these do is they absorb some of this upgoing infrared radiation. And so they don't keep getting hotter. They have to also emit it. But they emit it in all directions, including down. And so if you're at the surface, what you see is not just sunlight coming down, but infrared radiation from the greenhouse gases. So there are two sources of radiation, not just one. And so the surface has to get hot enough to balance not just the sunlight, but the back radiation from the atmosphere. Well, the back radiation is 24-7, unlike sunlight. It's always going on. And in fact, in the real world, we get twice as much radiation from the atmosphere as we do from the sun at the surface. That's remarkable. That little orange slice did that, OK? Um, and so that makes the difference between uh, uh, minus, so uh, whatever, what, what was it, minus 18 degrees and 15 degrees. So we're changing greenhouse gases. And the first guy to worry about this was the Swedish chemist uh, Svante Arrhenius, another polymath, uh, he looks even less happy than John Tyndall. And it makes me wonder, is this a problem with climate scientists that they're, you know, I, I don't know. I try to smile, but to try to counter the image of 
Um, and he uh, predicted toward the uh, beginning of the 20, uh, 20th century, the first one to do so, that if we kept burning fossil fuels and the CO2 content, the atmosphere were to increase, we'd raise the surface temperature by four degrees per doubling of CO2. The modern estimate is somewhere between two and 4.5 degrees. So that was a remarkable early estimate. No computers, no advanced math, a lot of shortcuts, as often happens when you do first estimates. A lot of the errors were canceling by statistical accident. Got about the right answer. You know, this is the wonderful thing about scientists. You can do an awful lot with pencil and paper. Was he right? Well, you can be the judge of that. So the blue line is a measure of the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere from 1880 to more or less the present. And the red line is the annual mean, global mean surface temperature, which is relatively well measured over this period. And you can see the temperature goes up and down, and there are all kinds of influences. But I would say Svante Harinius made a fairly successful prediction. And the idea that the world will warm up when you put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere was well established 100 years ago and does not depend upon fancy computers. They help, but that isn't what it's based on. It's based on just plain physics. Now, here is a record from ice cores, and then more recently from observations, of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere going back 800,000 years. This is the remarkable field of um, uh, paleoclimate. Uh, so the carbon dioxide uh, uh, concentration is from bubbles trapped in ice cores in Antarctica and Greenland. And you can see cycles in this, and these are the great ice ages, of which the last we came out of about 10,000 years ago. Um, that spike at the very right-hand side is what we did to the atmospheric CO2, what we collectively did to it. And again, uh, there's no doubt about that in the scientific community. That particular man-made CO2 has a particular isotopic signature, and that's what we see in the actual atmosphere. So this is all very well-established science. But what isn't so well-established is what is it actually going to do to weather? And that's a huge subject, but I can only talk on the, uh, touch on the subject by talking about hurricanes. So I want to talk to you now about how this climate change might affect hurricanes. But there's a lot more, obviously, to climate change than that. So I talked to you about potential intensity a few minutes ago. And uh, back in the late 80s, I figured out that if you put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere for fairly simple physics, again, not big computers, just simple physics, that this would have to go up. And um, made a prediction that it would go up, and, and in fact, it is going up. So this is an analysis from climate data, not climate models, but climate observations uh, from 1979 to 2018, showing the trend in meters per second per century of this potential intensity. And I'm only showing you that trend where it's statistically significant at some level, 5% level where it's green, there's no statistically significant trend. You can see in most places it's up. And it's up uh, about by about the amount we predicted it would go up. And it's going up in the regions where hurricanes typically uh, occur. So it's worrying. And uh, leads us to predict with some confidence that the intensity of hurricanes themselves should go up. Maybe not their frequency, but their intensity. And just a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine published a paper based on satellite data showing that uh, it is going up. So this graph shows the, potent, the proportion of major hurricane, of, sorry, the proportion of all hurricanes that go to major status. Major status is category three and above. They're the most intense storms. So the proportion of storms on the planet that are intense has been rising from 1980 to more or less the present. It's a very difficult analysis to do, and he's very quite gifted at doing that kind of analysis. So, all right, um, that is one of the risks of, of hurricanes. The other, going back to one of my earlier slides, is water. And one of the most robust predictions across any, any technique you care to use is that a given hurricane, even if its intensity didn't change, would produce a lot more rain. There's just a lot more water vapor in the atmosphere when you warm it up. 
So how do we go about actually turning this into meaningful numbers, that is, numbers that are meaningful to you? You're probably asking yourself, what do I care about potential intensity? And if I were in your seat, I'd be asking the same question. How do we turn that and all the other information we have into something that really means something to people who are trying to plan for the future or even plan for the present? I'll get back to what I mean by that. And we're not doing a very good job of it right now. So if you go around to insurance companies, municipalities that are trying to deal with hazards regardless of whether the climate is changing, like if you're a coastal community, maybe hurricanes, you want to know you're going to build a seawall, you want to know how big you should make it, how strong you should make it, you're going to have to go out and get some estimates of like what's the worst storm you're likely to have in the next 100 years. Even if the climate weren't changing, you'd need that information. We're not giving them, we collectively are not giving them very good information right now. If you go and look at risk modeling that's actually used around the world, it's almost all based strictly on the historical statistics of the hazard. You look at the history of hurricanes in certain places and you use that to estimate the risk. Well, that, that's an intelligent way to do it if that's all you've got. But there are problems with that. The historical records, for example, of hurricanes are very flawed, it turns out. People weren't recording hurricanes 50 years ago even for the sake of, well, some people wanted, might want to know what the statistics of hurricanes are. They were recording it so they could make better forecasts. They're short and the problem is that history is no longer a good guide to the present, let alone the future. That is, there's already been enough climate change that statistics going back 50 or 100 years really aren't a good basis for assessing risk. That's probably the most important thing I'm going to say to you today, all right? If you're interested in risk, don't rely on historical records, even if they are any good, because they're not relevant anymore. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that to you. The professional risk modelers um, hire armies of statisticians to go pour over the historical records. They do the best they can, but they're not taking into account that today is different from history. So the heart of the natural disaster problem is actually anthropological. And I find this fascinating and I wish I knew more about it. What you find when you look around the world is that societies, no matter what their stage of development, if they've been there for any length of time, are pretty well adapted to frequent events. That shouldn't be surprising. If you, know, if you have a 20 mile per hour wind every three weeks, your, your houses aren't going to fall down in front of it, right? It's common. Um, uh, but they are uh, poorly adapted to rare events. Now, in practice, what frequent and rare turn out to mean is something like uh, more than once in 100 years versus less than once in 100 years. What's magic about 100 years? I don't know. I suspect it's because it's a few human generations. You know what got you. You know what hit your parents. You might know what hit your grandparents. You probably have no idea what your great-grandparents dealt with. You might. Uh, it's, an anth it's sort of a cultural memory, but now I'm straying outside my expertise. There's something interesting about 100 years and so the, the um, result of that is if you have a climate um, where you have certain uh, probability of events and it shifts so that things that used to be less frequent than once in 100 years become more frequent than once in 100 years, you have a problem. So you, this is a graph that illustrates it. It's, it's a cartoon, but in fact, all real graphs look kind of like this. It's the percent of property destroyed versus a measure of the intensity of the hazard. And it actually doesn't matter what the hazard is. It doesn't matter if it's a hurricane, tornado, earthquake. Um, but it's, the measure is the return period. The return period is just a measure of frequency. So a return period of 100 means once in 100 years, or an annual probability of 1%. And the steep part of that curve is that right at 100 years. So any shift of that, if you shift that distribution to the left or the right, the biggest changes will occur around the 100-year storm. And that's why insurance companies are really worried about the 100-year event. OK, There's something, uh, something interesting about that. Now, the problem is the shape of that curve. So here is another uh, chart that shows you the probability 
Uh, this is an interesting one. This is actually the loss, monetary loss or estimated monetary loss to a particular portfolio, somebody's portfolio of insured property in the eastern U.S. Uh, and it's as a loss from hurricanes, an annual loss. If you focus on the blue curve, you see that it peaks at around, well, if you look at the bottom axis, 10 to the 6, a million dollars. So the, the most probable loss that that uh, portfolio will take um, over a long period of time is a million dollars. The red, the blue curve is for the climate of 1984 to 2014. The red is for the climate of the last 30 years of this century. And there's been a little shift of that probability to the right. So maybe instead of, it's a, remember, it's a log scale on the bottom, but uh, instead of it being a million dollars, maybe it's $2 million. It's actually not a big deal. Factor of two, OK, but there'll be inflation and things like that. That's the probability of the event. But what we really want to know is the probability of the amount of long-term damage. And that shows this is exactly the same data, except that we multiplied the probability by the damage itself. And what that means is if the area under these curves is actually the expected long-term damage. And now you can see it more than triples, goes up by a big factor uh, between um, the end of the 20th century and the end of the 21st century. And you'll notice that the most, uh, that this happens in the tails of these distributions. And it's not around 10 to the 6 years, it's around 10 to the 8th. Uh, 10 to the six dollars, it's around 10 to the eighth or, or 100 million dollars. And this is an illustration of the very, very important thing called tail risk. Long-term damages come from rare events. They don't come from the everyday events, even though there are a lot more everyday events, because damage goes up so quickly with the intensity of the event, it's the rare events that get you in the long run for almost everything. Okay, it's such an important point. And the problem is that we ha it's hopeless to try to estimate the probability of these rare events because they're rare. We, don't, we would need 1,000 years of records to get the 100-year event. And we don't have 1,000 years of records. Um, so we have maybe 70 years of good records uh, in the US, a lot less than that elsewhere. But even if we had hundreds of years of great records, the problem is that that distribution is shifting. So the past is no longer a good guide to the present. It's certainly not a good guide to the future either, but it's not even a good guide to the present. So existing risk uh, records are off. Now, they're not all off in the wrong sense. There are places in the world and, and particular quantities that get better with climate change. But in any case, the, the historically based risk assessments are usually not very good. So we need to turn to physical models um, to make better estimates of current and future weather risks. One such model is a climate model. And this is just a picture of the output of a global climate model. And um, they are basically algorithms for solving all the known equations governing the behavior of the fluids that's worth weeks and weeks of lectures. I won't bore you with all of that, but I think you've heard something about climate models. So why don't we just use those to simulate future hurricanes? This is a problem with that. And that is they're too coarse. Their spatial resolution is too coarse to do that. That's illustrated by this chart. Um, this shows the frequency of storms uh, in these climate models as a function of how strong the winds are in the storms. And so you're going from 10 meters per second on the left to 90 meters per second on the right. The um, vertical black line is the division between category two and below and category three and above. And you can see that the red curve, which is the computer models curves, don't simulate anything above category three. In other words, they don't simulate the damaging storms. They only simulate the weak storms. The black is, is the observed over the last uh, s several decades. There are a lot more uh, storms that are damaging. So global models don't simulate the storms that cause damage. So uh, we have to be, be clever here, and we use physics as a long story behind this to assess, help us assess hurricane risk. The way we do it is we start with 
fairly reliable global records of the coarse scale climate, not the hurricanes themselves. And they're robust and widely available. We call from these statistics that are known to be environmental controls of hurricanes, including their generation, movement, and intensity, bootstrap those to create an unlimited synthetic time series of hurricane-related variables, and then use those to drive a specialized, very, very high-resolution physical model of hurricanes, which is coupled to the ocean. There's a lot in this, and of course I can't describe it to you, but you would only believe it if you do compare it very rigorously to, to well-measured storms in the historical period. So you have to do that step. It turns out uh, it works very well. And um, we can use it to do things like uh, a study we did for Hong Kong some years ago, and we generated 4,500 tropical cyclones, all of which pass within 100 kilometers of Hong Kong. You can do this for any place on the planet. You're seeing their tracks there. Uh, the colors are a measure of the wind speed. I now have overlaid in magenta color uh, historical tracks. Um, so you can, it's just an eyeball comparison. It doesn't mean much quantitatively. Um, this is the number of storms per month in the Atlantic observed is the blue dots. And this uh, physical modeling that we're doing, uh, generating thousands and thousands of synthetic storms, is in red. So we have to subject this method to some really, really rigorous tests against everything that we do believe from the climatological record. I won't go into it more. Once having done that, you can apply the same technique to climate models to generate these synthetic storms. This shows the global frequency of Category 5 hurricanes in the climate up to the present, more or less, in blue and then projected in the future, assuming we don't do much about greenhouse gas emissions in red. The scatter, the shading, shows the scatter among the nine models that we used to, to uh, that we applied this technique to. So there is uncertainty, as always, in any kind of modeling enterprise. Then we can start to bring things down to the local level by maps like this. This is showing the 100-year uh, wind, that is the uh, wind speed associated with an annual probability of 1% um, from eight climate models, this is sort of the average over those eight models from 1984 to 2014. You can see the wind speed scale. This is in the quaint units of knots on the right. To just get an idea of the colors here. So this is basically applicable to the centroid of each county in the US. Now we're going to take the same map and the same color scale and look forward to the end of this century. You can see it goes up in most places. It gets redder, OK? If I go back and forth a few times. Um, just about everywhere experiences an increase in the risk of strong winds from hurricanes. Um, we can apply, we can uh, now start to get to the problem of water, all right? And uh, once you have all these synthetic storms, you can use them to drive uh, hydrodynamic models of storm surges. Storm surges are the same thing as a tsunami physically except they're created by wind rather than shaking earth. And they arrive in the middle of a horrible storm. So if you can imagine the combination, that's what kills a lot of people. We did a study for New York back in 2008 of their current uh, surge risk doing this. I did this with a postdoc, Ning Lin. And then we also looked out to the future and included the effects of sea level rise. So this shows for four downscaling four different climate models, these four panels, the flood height as a function of this return period at the battery in New York, in Manhattan. So black is the current climate, red and blue, they're slightly different versions of the future climate. And you can see that you get pretty big uh, increases, some of which is just caused by sea level rise in surge heights. That paper came out about five months before Hurricane Sandy hit New York. So we had, uh, unfortunately, we were ahead of the curve on that. But then rain is the other big water problem. And this, the synthetic events do produce rain, 
So this is a very, very rare storm in the, in the current climate, more or less the current climate, that affected Houston, Texas. I don't know if you can see the map. We're in the northwestern Gulf. And this is the storm total rainfall from a single hurricane that came in from the south, southeast, and stalled right offshore, and then moved back out to sea. And while it stalled, it just rained and rained and rained, and it produced 50 inches of rain in southeastern Texas. Well, you can imagine what that would do. Now, that's an extraordinarily rare event uh, for that climate. But now let's look at, the, again, the 100-year rainfall on the same kind of map that I showed you before. This is for the end of the 20th century, early 21st century. And you can see, uh, if you look at the color scale, that this is, I'm sorry to keep switching units on you. I really need to do a better job of that. I borrow charts from different talks. This is in millimeters now to give you some notion of rain. The rainfall that flooded Houston in 2017 was about 800 millimeters. And these 100-year uh, events aren't uh, too worrisome. Uh, they're in the sort of light blue range, maybe 400 to 600 millimeters. That would actually cause problems in most places. Now we go to the end of this century, and it's a completely different story. There are places in the northern Gulf, southeastern Florida, it could have well over a meter of rain, three feet of rain in a single storm. That's the, again, 1% annual probability storm. Uh, so I don't want to run out of time for questions. And let me just finish it up. In the end of the day, we have to make it personal. We have to ask, this is what you don't want to have happen to your house, right? And what is the probability of something like that happening to every person's home? Let's start with that. And not just property damage, but to their health, to their lives, lives in general. And um, there are nonprofits springing up that try to do this. So I'm going to end with this. This, is, um, this has just progressed to the point where you can go out right now on the internet and get this data for, your, for wherever you live, OK? Uh, I chose um, this um, uh, web real estate clearinghouse called realtor.com. You can easily find that. You type in an address. This is a random pick. It ha happens to be a, a house in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Uh, nothing to do with this house. If any of you own this house, I apologize for what's to come. Uh, there it is, a satellite map. It's not far from a lake. And you can see all kinds of data you'd expect to see if you were interested in buying this property, the price, the number of bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But you also see a list, I don't know if you can read it, of other data, property details, property history. Down there, near the bottom, is environmental risk. That's new. And that's what these nonprofits have contributed to this. And I contributed, in turn, to the, the data from tropical cyclones to this nonprofit called First Street. And if you, t if you hit that tab, you'll get um, uh, the likelihood that you'll have some, you can specify the amount, some water, some level of water in your house within some period of years. This happens to be six inches within 15 years. It's pretty high. It's 41%. And I don't know if you can see the shading. If you go out to 20, 25, 30 years, by 30 years, it's 76%. Now, would you buy that house if you knew that? OK. And then at the bottom, it says how much money you're expected to lose by buying this house because of its susceptibility to floods. Not wind, just floods. So if we start doing this, if we start trying to make it possible for people to calculate their own risks and companies and governments, right, including the whole federal government, when we can start to have the numbers, which, by the way, have to include uncertainties on which you might act. So let me wrap, wrap it up. Uh, physically, hurricanes are examples of organized structures that arise whenever you have conditions of strong thermodynamic disequilibrium. Some of you might remember the work of a French physicist Prigogine on this. This thermodynamic disequilibrium exists between the tropical oceans and atmosphere, and it's caused by the greenhouse effect. I didn't really make that clear in my talk, but if you took the greenhouse gases away, that disequilibrium would go away as well. So logically, adding greenhouse gases increases the degree of disequilibrium, which increases the probability of having these organized structures. 
they are clearly significant societal hazards. And then on the social side, I'm making strong arguments. We cannot rely on historical data to estimate risk from natural weather hazards anymore. We just can't, okay? Especially if we're interested in the tails of the data. The, the data isn't long enough, it's not good enough, and it's already been altered by climate change. And we can't just regard climate change as a problem for the future. All the insurance companies in the U.S. Has, in the last three years have woken up to this. Oh, we're writing one-year contracts, we don't need to worry. No, you've got wrong estimates of risk, you're setting the premiums wrong. They get that now, okay? Harvey's rainfall was three times more likely in 2017 than it had been in 1970, for example. And hurricane-induced flooding is the most serious potential effect of climate change on hurricane risk. Thank you.